people don't remember these atrocities until they're 52 years old. It's a very specific number. And so uh, the research is saying that these people who were abused when they were 10 years old and are now in their 50s are just now allowing their mind to remember these things. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and speak with you. Um, just some background about me. Uh, my name's Todd Matthews. I'm a partner at the Bailey Glasser firm. Um, we're a large nationwide firm handling everything from these sex abuse cases, asbestos, you know, played an instrumental role in the uh, J&J and 3M bankruptcy uh, plays that played out over the last few years. And fortunately, those uh, ended well for all of the plaintiffs and uh, showed corporate America they can't play this bankruptcy card uh, to try and uh, defeat their liability and their responsibility to these plaintiffs. So uh, what I want to try and talk to you about today is uh, these abuse cases playing out all over the country. Uh, this is a, a horrible epidemic uh, that has just plagued our country for years. And finally, the states are implementing some safeguards that are allowing for people who have been abused over the years to come forward and have not only a voice in this, but try to find some closure for themselves through um, holding those responsible uh, for what was done to them uh, when they were the most vulnerable in their life. And so uh, we're, we're very honored to be representing these survivors. Um, and Maryland is a perfect example of what I believe is the right way that things are getting done. Okay, so you just mentioned, you know, Maryland, right before we came on, we were talking about a couple of other states, which might be, they opened up a window. And, uh, you know, in theory, they're saying, oh, you have a year, two years to file, or however it is, uh, where Maryland opened it up to kind of uh, an open-ended process. Do you want to cover that a little? Yeah. So we're really seeing two things play out across the states and the way they're addressing these issues. Some states like California are introducing legislation and passing it that's saying to the survivors, look, uh, you may not have known that your abuse had occurred, um, you may have learned of it and didn't file timely then. Um, and they're opening it up and saying, all right, for a, a window of time, for two years, for example, in California, you can go back and you can file a claim if you were abused as a child, um, either through some system or, I guess, in theory, against an individual, although the individual rarely has the resources to compensate a, a survivor. Um, but they open the window up for two years to allow for those cases to be filed. And so then if you were, um, let's say, a, a member of uh, the church and you were abused at church uh, back in the 80s uh, and you, you remembered it in the 80s, well, in theory, your time limit would have started running from the time you remembered what happened to you for the applicable statute of limitations. Well, in California, they said for a two-year period, we're going to allow you to look back and so you can go ahead and file your claim in this two-year window. That two-year window in California closed sometime late last year. In states like Maryland, uh, which is really, in my opinion, the way things should be handled, is they've looked back and said, look, these are horrors and atrocities that were uh, placed upon these children. And we're not going to let uh, some sort of a, a statute of limitations impede their ability to find some justice in this system. And so what Maryland has done is they've gone back and said, there is no longer a statute of limitations. Not only is there not a statute of limitations, uh, we're applying that retroactively. So anybody who's been abused as a child can now file their claim. We are going to set aside the notice requirements under the Maryland tort uh, victims uh, law uh, we're going to say you didn't have to provide that notice in that period of time. Uh, the statute of repose has been dealt with. And so, you know, we uh, represent some folks that, you know, were abused as children, even as late as the 70s. Um, and uh, it's right. And here's why it's right. Recent studies are showing that uh, lots of people don't remember these atrocities until they're 52 years old. It's a very specific number. And so uh, the research is saying that these people who were abused when they were 10 years old and are now in their 50s are just now allowing their mind 
to remember these things. They're at a point in their life where they're comfortable with other parts of their life. And so their mind allows them to recall what had occurred to them as children. So it makes sense when you really look at the science as to why these doors are opening. So uh, what we are doing is we represent uh, over 500 uh, children or adults now, but folks who were children uh, in the Maryland Juvenile Hall System or the Juvenile Justice System, where they got placed into a juvenile facility. Uh, some of them having never committed or even been accused of committing a crime. Uh, who the state of Maryland just ran out of places to put kids who were taken out, taken out of their homes. They were put in these facilities and just the abuse is astronomical. We have some uh, that were as young as seven when they were abused. We have some that were abused over a hundred times. Um, we have many that were abused by the same abuser, but they never knew each other. They weren't there at the same time. So there was this systematic pattern going on at these facilities with the same guards, um, the same supervisors of those guards present, but the, the children completely different overlap. So we know that their account of what happened is real. It validates their story by what somebody five years after them had happened exactly the same way, not knowing each other at any time in their life. And so, um, so we have filed uh, six separate complaints um, against the state of Maryland, uh, who holds the liability for this. Um, we have filed those against um, them in waves against each facility that these kids were at. Um, so if they were at the Hickey facility, we filed one complaint against them and uh, Cheltenham, and it goes on and on and on. So... Um, we think we're going to be able to find some help for these uh, survivors. We think we're going to be able to find some closure for them in, in a lot of ways. They'll, they, they are looking for finality to this, that somebody was held responsible, that somebody listened to them, that somebody believed them. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to accomplish through this whole process. Okay. So it seems that, I mean, it's been the dirty little secret in the, uh, I guess you would call it governmental affairs world. I, I deal with a lot of state legislatures for various reasons. And that is the bring that topic up. And I've heard the discussions among some of these stakeholders. That's the fastest way to clear a room because everybody knows that it's going, it's going to be expensive, embarrassing, cumbersome. And uh, just, it, it seems like the scale of what was going on going back you know, let's just say the 60s, 70s, and and then it morphed a little bit into uh, kind of the private institutions where they were sending kids to other states and things. And this was all under some, quite often a court structure. It Doesn't that just kind of make it that much worse whenever there were, you know, people involved in the court process there along the way? Well, you know, um, sure, it does in the respect of, you know, you've got this government out there that is you're paying tax dollars to. And now these vulnerable children are being placed into the custody of the state. And these atrocities just occur over and over and over. And you bring up kind of a great point for Maryland. Um, you know, the newly appointed Maryland Secretary of Juvenile Services um, used to be the executive director of a uh, an operation called the Center of Juvenile and Criminal Justice. And back in 2001, um, he said, uh, and this is the quote, if you were sort of a mad scientist who was sent to Maryland to deliberately make kids into criminals, you could hardly do any better than that what's going on in the Maryland juvenile facilities. You'd have to work hard to cripple kids worse than they're being crippled now. And so fast forward, you know, 22 years, and now this person is the Secretary of Juvenile Services. And I will give a hand to the current administration in Maryland. Both the governor and the attorney general were very supportive of this bill whenever it got passed. Um, and the attorney general actually came out and said that the judicial system should provide a means for survivors who have suffered these harms to seek damages from the people 
and the institutions responsible for them. And so, you know, the attorney general's office is the uh, legal body that's defending these cases. And so we hope that given the current climate of the administration in Maryland, that they're going to work with us uh, to try and find some solution for these survivors. And I'm, I'm very optimistic that that's going to happen. Uh, one of the things that kind of uh, I, I'm kind of showing some perceived prejudice against the South, but, you know, whether it's uh, Hollywood cliches or whatever, everyone would tend to and everyone has that I've been talking to always were like, well, you know, this is a, a deep Mississippi and those, you know, Alabama and, and things like that where those issues are in their their juvenile system. Here, this is Maryland. Maryland is right, you know, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Delaware. Those are, you know, those are modern tech-centric, you know, everything going on there. So it shows that the level of kind of, uh, you know, the institutional issues in juvenile sex abuse, abuse in general is everywhere, and it is right there kind of predominantly. It really, it really is a a sign of this being a nationwide epidemic. It is not relegated to one specific area of the country. Um, it's not relegated to one specific um, administration or political body. You know, you can't look at it and say, "Well, when the Republicans were in charge, this happened. When the Democrats were in charge, that happened." It is an across the board breakdown of the system. And if you go back and you start talking about the 70s and 80s and, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of regulation, there wasn't a whole lot of oversight. And so you can see how these things happened. And, um, you know, unfortunately, these the stories we're hearing from these survivors, it was as if they were placed into an animal stockade and just treated like like animals. Right. So. As part of the, the process, I mean, I know that, the, you know, financial compensation is always going to be the target, but do you see uh, the state as a group or any specific governing body or someone trying to, you, know, you mentioned the AG and others being involved in whatever they have due notice now, but do you see that they're going to try to, you know, uh, do anything for like mental health services, treatment services or something, but also to change the policy and procedures that enabled it? to go on. Now, now that's, that's some of the good news, Mark, is, you know, the, the atrocities that we're seeing, uh, for the most part, are not um, recent, meaning, you know, it looks like states like Maryland have already taken those steps to start cleaning this up, to have more regulation, to have more oversight, to have, um, to hold the employees of these facilities uh, responsible. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of the uh, employees being charged with these crimes. Um, and, and to that part of this, uh, that's something we're fully in support of helping the AG prosecute the people who caused these uh, harms to our clients and seeing that, you know, those folks aren't in the system any longer. And from what we've learned so far, many of them are no longer in the system. And, uh, but that's absolutely something that has to happen. This is a little bit off topic. It goes into the institutional abuse. I understand that Florida has a an uh, offboarding. They they ship a lot of the kids to some facilities in Ohio, which uh, I don't know if they're nonprofit. They change their name a lot. They get a kid is killed. They do something. They just flip the name at the Secretary of State, and it's business as usual. But people have talked about this gray area of he's not in Florida anymore. It's not our problem. And the people in Ohio are like, well, he's a Florida resident or he's custodial state is Florida. It's not our problem. Do you see that as something that might be jumping into some of this litigation as these things uh, emerge, the, the abuses? So, yeah. So there are a lot of private um, companies around the country that provide these services for um, the state or for health care systems. And we do have this in Maryland where there were uh, uh, companies providing services to the state at their facilities. Uh, we view it as it's the state's responsibility. The state had control and custody of that minor child. So if they elected to send them to Ohio, 
for uh, housing and treatment, if they, as they like to call it. Um, the state is the one that made that decision. The state had the responsibility to vet that facility and that provider. And uh, certainly they were negligent in placing those kids in an environment like that if it was able to be known. And as you just said, it's almost always able to be known. They've almost always had some other problem under some other name. And so uh, I would not only hold the facility responsible, but also the state. All right. And you see this as being a fairly large, just talking business. Now, this is probably going to be a very large docket across the country because everyone's going to start looking closer. You know, I think uh, sex abuse cases in general are going to uh, start getting a law uh, a look at, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, it's just it's unimaginable that this occurs, and we as plaintiffs' lawyers, uh, you know, most of us got into this business because we want to stand up for the people who can't stand up for themselves, and so I think that's one. Two, I think the laws are changing in a way that's allowing. Uh, the states and the facilities and the churches to be held accountable. Um, and, you know, three, there are legal benefits to this. I mean, you're rarely going to have a Daubert challenge. Your damages are going to not be as difficult to prove up in certain circumstances. And so you've got, you know, some, some legal reasons that people uh, in our profession might want to get into these cases. Um, hey, and as I say that, I also say it's not without its uh, challenges. You know, we have hired an entire uh, team of social workers that uh, deal with our survivors that we represent because you can't uh, go and represent these people like you would on a Roundup case or an asbestos case where you take your laundry list of items that you need to know what happened and just ask them, you know, OK, well, now, did this happen to you? Did that happen to you? Uh, you will absolutely re-traumatize uh, these survivors if you do that. And that is the last thing that we as plaintiff's lawyers should be doing is harming our own clients. Sure. And it seems that uh, going back to the uh, church sex abuse, the clergy abuses, and everyone was like, oh, this is a one-off. You know, we're going to get this. It's going to go away. It's going to be done. Then the Boy Scouts came out and that was like a huge thing. And now it seems like just, that uh, the Band-Aid's been yanked off and everyone is there. Like these, there are some catastrophic things going on in this country that have just been suppressed or just kind of out of sight, out of mind for a long time that in this day and age are, you know, talking points and for plaintiff's lawyers where it's just now it's seen as a actionable tort as a practice area for a firm. Is that kind of where you see it going as a normal thing now? I, I do. I think, um, you know, look, five years ago when we started the 3M uh, earplug litigation, right, the biggest fear on that was the government was going to be held with liability and there was no way that we were ever going to get paid by the government. Well, fast forward now, we've got Camp Lejeune, we got an act passed, and we've got the government willing to pay out and be responsible for the harms that they've done. And I think it's the same way with these abuse cases where now the law is changing. We as plaintiff's lawyers couldn't couldn't pursue these claims the way we wanted to because the law wasn't there to help us. But now the, the state legislature is starting to get on board and say, gosh, these people have been really, really harmed and we've got to do something to help them. And again, it transcends politics. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's a human issue. And so I think you're seeing the law start to change in that regard. Um, as to the clergy abuse specifically, you know, what we saw happen up in Maryland, um, the law went into effect October 1st of this year, just uh, 30 days ago. Um, the uh, Diocese of Baltimore files for bankruptcy on the Friday before the law even went into effect. Um, can they it's do just, that? <laughs> what's that? Can they do? Can they do a perceived bankruptcy filing? Well, sure, they, they they can because they can say we've already been told of X number of claims, and uh, those claims outweigh our financial right. resources. In theory, you know, here's the thing with the the clergy abuse cases. In my opinion, um, I think we're going to continue seeing um, dioceses, individual dioceses, file for bankruptcy. 
I think it's the same attempt that we saw with J&J and 3M to avoid liability. They just want this problem to go away. They will hide behind the fact that they they think this is the more efficient and effective way to pay client to pay these claimants, which is complete and total nonsense. It's a way for uh, the the uh, diocese or 3M or J and J to shield their liability and to protect as much money as they possibly can. Um, I think for the clergy abuse cases to be really successful. You're going to have to get to Rome. You're going to have to figure out a way to make the Catholic Church international uh, responsible. And I do believe there is a way to do that. From all of our bankruptcy experience, from the things that uh, we've worked on through our bankruptcy department, I absolutely think there's a way to get to Rome. I think it just has to be done. Of all the things that I've thought about, like in all these legal dockets and concepts and everything going around i have always wondered how the vatican and i'm not targeting them but just as a as a recognized country state whatever you want to refer to it how they've been able to escape lot you know being held accountable and whenever they were complicit in a lot of activities that were shown to move people around it's very much like um the southern baptist convention as well it's the way that they have it legally structured uh, to where, um, you know, each diocese kind of stands on its own. And um, and so the liability kind of begins and ends with that diocese. Now, I, I, there's a very strong argument, as you said, that, uh, you know, the shots are being called from Rome, where priests go, where priests get resent, uh, what they know, what they didn't know, what they told people. So I do think you're going to see that come. Um, I do think you're going to see a lot of heat and pressure put on. Uh, this uh, uh, concept of getting to Rome, um, but somebody just has to do it. And, you know, f- look, trust me, fighting the Vatican is not um, an easy task. It right. might be the hardest task. Um, and, and I do acknowledge that and, and, and realize that, you know, it, it is an uphill battle, but sure. it's going to have to be done for these survivors to to be compensated for what has happened to them. Right. Well, you know, uh, that's just it's encouraging to see that uh, this is being it's developed and everything like the docket's well on its way to uh, really getting out there. Uh, do you see it turning into some type of a, an MDL or an organized docket in some way? So, you know, I, I think it probably could. Um, you know, I'm fond of saying, including myself, we in the plaintiff's bar are sometimes our own worst enemies. So I think we got to be very careful in the way that we think about these cases because they are very individual and very unique. The worst thing that we can do as a plaintiff's bar is treat these survivors as just a a docket and a book of business because these are highly, highly, highly personal issues. And we really could do more harm to these survivors uh, by handling these cases the wrong way. So I would encourage anybody listening, uh, anybody thinking about getting into these cases to have a plan before you head down that road. I mean, I would, social workers are the key to this because they're trained. They know how to address these issues. They know how to provide services. Just real quick, I'll give you a couple of examples. I, I myself have spent hours on the phone after having received training on how to deal with these these cases um, and these clients hours on the phone with suicidal uh, survivors. And so, you know, that's not something they train us to do in law school. So you, you've really got to be mindful of the way you're going about addressing these cases. And uh, Bailey Glasser and yourself, you're open to co-counsel and referral relationships. Yep, absolutely. Okay, we will make sure we put your all your contact information here at the end of this. Well, that, this is you know you know a very positive thing going forward, and you guys seem to have uh, you know have a really good start on things. And of course, you're open to referrals and co counsels, which, as you know as well, a lot of times there's a lot of cases sitting out there. People just don't know what what to do with them once they get them. Once you get the tiger by the tail, where do you put it? Absolutely. We, yeah, we'd be happy okay. to speak with you and, and happy to, you know, talk about your, your clients and your survivors and, 
please just please be mindful of these folks and, and what they're going through. Okay, now switching gears just a little bit, uh, uh, going to kind of go over to that, that bankruptcy question and the thoughts about J and J and uh, you know the three M, which was you know congrats there again. But um, you had mentioned that J and J is seems to be uh, talking about or strategizing on possibly a, uh, another bankruptcy. Yeah. So in their latest um, uh, stockholders meeting, uh, they have mentioned filing for a third time. Now, to me, it's unconscionable that they would even think about it. Um, you know, the appellate court in round one was extremely straightforward in their position that they were not in economic distress when they filed for this. Um, they certainly did not develop new economic distress in the two hours and 48 minutes it took them to refile the second one from the first one being dismissed. Um, this is nothing short of criminal in my mind. Um, I, for them to file a third time to delay these victims' compensation uh, further, um, I mean, it's been 10 or 11 years now that some yeah. of these folks have been waiting. Um it's nothing but a game to J&J &J as to how long they can delay having to pay these victims. And there is the science is clearly there. Uh, the judge in the MDL on the Daubert orders clearly said there was enough evidence uh, in the opinions to show a connection and to present it to the jury. J&J &J needs to let these cases go forward. Um, and, and, you know, Filing for a third time is just an abuse of the process. It's an abuse of everything that we know and stand for as lawyers in general. Um, so I, I hope that they don't. I hope that they will just finally um, step up to the table and do what they should have done, you know, eight or nine years ago. Right. And then uh, going over to, to the 3M, that was uh, a great result. Uh, I mean, do you see that as a model to follow whatever you're, you know, defending for, you know, or, or, or put against a, a bankruptcy? Well, yeah, I mean, the theory in both of those ultimately ended up being the same thing, that that the company just is not in financial distress. They uh, it was. And so absolutely, I do. Um, I think uh, the di difference between J&J &J and 3M, quite frankly, was the uh, judge at the trial court level. I think, um, you know, uh, the judge in the 3M case had the benefit of having seen what happened in the J&J case and was able to avoid some of the landmines that, uh, you know, befell the trial court decision in the first round of J&J. &J. Um, but yeah, I hope that the outcome of 3M and the outcome of the first two J&J bankruptcies is kind of a roadmap for the defendants on how to avoid doing the bankruptcy play, how it does not um, help them. The only thing it does is delay and quite frankly, ends up costing them more money in the end. Right. And uh, I mean, is J&J uh, &J going to try forum shopping again? You know, are they, or. Are they... <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't foresee J&J &J going back to New Jersey. Um, right. But with that being said, uh, you know, that's not where they started the first uh bankruptcy. They started in North Carolina and were rightfully sent to New Jersey, where uh, if they filed for a third time, I don't, they won't file there, but there's no reason they shouldn't. If they, sure. you know, I, I think another court that they would file in uh, very well may do what the North Carolina court did and send them back to New Jersey. Okay. Uh, now switching to another topic, you mentioned CLJ, Camp Lejeune. So here we are, it, it's it's well on its way. I don't. I imagine you were at MTMP a couple of weeks ago. Whenever uh, that esteemed gentleman now from well, but Puerto Rico, Mr. Watts, he he had he made his statement about things, and that is something I am much more involved on the business operational side of things. And I see, and I noticed, and I know from talking attrition, some of the you know the write offs and this and that. It's been common knowledge for two years, you know, or even longer, but this seemed to kind of bring it up. And do you think that that's going to have an impact on the viability of the docket itself where, or are people going to try to 
you know, the chamber and others, are they going to try to like use that as a, a, a wrench to throw into the works? Well, look, I think, you know, one, I, I agree with, with Michael, you know, uh, there's so much um, abuse in our field right now with, you know, leads that aren't leads with, you know, companies that are, are not doing things the ethical way. Um, it is absolutely uh, affecting our dockets, the ability to resolve these dockets. I mean, look, if I'm a defendant and you come and tell me you've got 100,000 claims, well, that does get pretty challenging to settle. Um, if only 20,000 of them are valid claims, well, that's a lot easier to talk about resolution. I think that the types of things Michael's talking about um, is um, it's talking points for the Chamber of Commerce when they're trying to get things passed that they want. I absolutely think it could be used. Uh, we've already seen the knockdown of the fees or the, you know, the position of the government on fees in these cases. I think it helps with those types of arguments whenever they're trying to make them to the court, to the legislature, to, you know, quite frankly, anybody who will listen and has a little bit of authority. So I think it's dangerous. Um, and I've been preaching this for the last six years. Uh, you know, I think, um, Funding in our space is a good thing because I do think it helps level the playing field with the big corporations. I think irresponsible use of funding is what we're seeing now and is having a detrimental effect on our practice. And quite frankly, if we as a plaintiff's uh, bar don't rein it in ourselves, somebody will rein it in for us. And yeah. uh, it's like the judge always says in, in family court, you know, you husband and wife are going to be a lot happier uh, making a decision and agreeing to something on your own than having me, the court, make a decision. Um, and it's yeah. it's kind of the same thing. I think we've got to be a lot more responsible with the funding in this space. Yes. Um, we were at uh, the GW Law Bench Bar event uh, last year, and there was a judge that was kind of discussing some of those things. And they say, you know, Quite often, we don't become aware of those until that horse is gone. And then it's either you govern yourself accordingly while you can, or you're going to put us in the position where we have to govern for you. And that's just whenever it, it, it's really not the good time. So um, yeah. are there any other uh, specific, you know, dockets, torques, causes that uh, you're involved in that you want to touch on? You know, you've really, we've really highlighted them right now. The, the sex abuse cases are very uh, important to me. Um, I, I grew up in the church, heavily involved in the church, uh, was headed to be a Southern Baptist preacher at one point, um, had some dealings with um, the abuse going on um, in the religious uh, community. And that's what, quite frankly, turned me uh, into a, a plaintiff's trial lawyer. Um, and so it's a, it, but it's an issue that's always been very important to me. Uh, now that we have some ability to, to proceed, um, it's something that, you know, I think we all should take a look at and, uh, attempt to figure out a way to help these survivors. There are so many more survivors out there in the world that we just take for granted that we know that, that are probably in our, offices, in our companies, in our social circle, that uh, they're suffering this trauma quietly and silently, and they need to have a voice. Okay. All right. And with that, before we wrap up here, contact information, if uh, you know a, a firm there in Missouri could be, or anywhere else, wants to contact you about co-counseling, referring, et cetera. Yep. Uh, so, what's the best way to do that? Absolutely. You can always go to baileyglasser.com and find my link or David Selby's link. Uh, it's a B-A-I-L-E-Y-G-L-A-S-S-E-R.com. You can always uh, email me at T Matthews. That's one T in the last name, which always throws everyone uh, at the same uh, website address. Um, or uh, most a lot of people, a lot of your listeners uh, know me, have my cell phone number. You're always welcome to call me. And then, uh, Mark, I'm sure we'll put um, contact information uh, on this podcast. Yes, we will. And we'll, and with that, you know, Todd, I really want to say thanks. This was informative and very timely. 
and uh, we will follow up in three months to see where things are at on the sex abuse. I think that would be a good uh, benchmark. We would be happy to, to talk about it and give you an update at that time. And hopefully I'll have more and better information then. Okay. Thank you very much for being on LegalCast. Thank you. Appreciate it.